We have two guests today from Oklahoma. Uh, to my far left is Sam Scott, and to my left is Archie Sam. Uh, both men live in Oklahoma City, and I'm going to ask each one of them to tell you a little bit about themselves. So, Archie, if you'll start first. I'm a member of Cherokee tribe by law, I suppose, but by tradition and by blood, um, member of a Cherokee tribe, a Natchez tribe, and a Creek tribe. And I've been brought up in traditional manners. I've been taught so many customs and history. I'm pretty well informed of all the traditional activities, and I consider myself a traditional. Not only that, I consider myself conservative traditional. And a little bit above that, I consider myself ultra conservative traditional because I, I kind of understand my uh, way of living and uh, I like to practice it to preserve a lot of history, a lot of ceremonies, and mostly the, the traditional heritage. So I'm glad to be here today. Tell us, uh, tell us where you were born. I was born in a little town of Braggs, Oklahoma. It's the uh, eastern part of uh, Oklahoma and the heart of the uh, traditional people and the Cherokee traditional people that, uh, that preserved and participated in a lot of the traditional uh, ceremonial uh, functions uh, when it was just in, in a full uh, participation. So uh, that's, uh, that's what I generally uh, like to, uh, to do mostly. Okay, Mr. Scott. My name's Sam Scott. I'm Creek, Full Bed Creek Indian. And of all my life that I can remember from my uh, youth on up, when I was just a kid, I was raised up around among my um, uh, tribal people and around the stomp grounds. And as I grew up older, why, I participated in the stomp dances and some of the dances that they have, I participated in some. And, and this is something that I have never been to or I've never been around like this. It's kind of, uh, kind of make me scary a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when I'm around my Indians, why, uh, um, I think I'm about uh, top speaker at home. And, uh, in fact, uh, well, there's two of us. My brother, he's, right now, he's taking over. But uh, I was at times that I, that I was the main speaker on my stomp ground. And, and I was born and raised around Wetumpka. That's about uh, 100 miles east of Oklahoma City. And my stomp ground is Alabama. That's where I was raised up at. You didn't tell us the name of your stomp grounds. Mine? Uh -huh. Well, uh, the grounds that I happen to be a uh, part of is called the Medicine Spring. It has quite a history because uh, when their first uh, Indians arrived in the state of Oklahoma, was Indian Territory then, they had uh, had carried a lot of their uh, ceremonial uh, paraphernalia and ceremonial fire and everything else already over and established in, uh, in what is now uh, Oklahoma. But that ceremonial ground was established in 1839. It's still functional, and that's what I belong to. And it has a Cherokee name, and it has a Creek name. And Cherokees call it New War T, and uh, Creeks call it Uge Hiliswa. That means uh, water medicine. Whenever the fire was brought over, they located a sulfur spring, sulfurous spring. And they thought they needed that water to, uh, as part of the ceremonial functions, and they opened their grounds right close to it. 
and that's where the first uh, landing of a uh, ceremonial center in what is now Cherokee Nation. Of course, it had been moved twice since then, but it's still functional today as it was before. So the Madison Spring is my uh, ceremonial ground, which I belong to, which I happen to be the, one of the elders that uh, keep the grounds moving and ceremonially functional today. Okay. Um, the class is going to have a lot of questions, I'm sure, as we go along. So I want now to invite them, if you have any questions, just general questions, not about particular songs or anything of that nature. If you want to know something about the Cherokees or about the creeks or what a stomp ground is or anything like that, you know, feel, feel free to uh, ask these gentlemen because they're the experts. I'd like to know what a stomp ground is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she wants to know what a stomp ground is. <laughs> <laughs> whenever, whenever the first white man saw the Indian dancing, well, he said they were stomping. So he nomad uh, stomp dancing, and stomp grounds is, is a ceremonial ground that's uh, located in a certain village or a certain community or a certain area that everybody that used to come to to perform their ceremonial functions. Uh, at the ceremonial grounds, the stomp grounds, uh, that's where they had their, supposedly, something like city hall. That's where all the decisions were made pertaining to uh, tribal functions, be it economically, socially, historically, politically, whatever. It was supposed to be decided at that ground. And everybody do come there to, to hear the latest issue and, you know, to perform in their ceremonial functions, whatever it goes on. Stomp Grounds is a civic center of an Indian community, historically. It's not so much that anymore, but that's what it was all 50 years ago. Uh, Mr. Scott? Yes. Uh, can I ask you what tribe, uh, what clan you're from? What clan? Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm the wind, and my dad is, is a tiger, and so my mother, she was a wind. We go after our right. mother. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there a, uh, a dance for the wind? Uh, if there is, I, I never did learn anything about it. <laughs> I never did learn anything about it. There, there is one for the tiger, isn't there? Yeah, I've, I've heard that these others, they have mm -hmm. danced for the, you know, but, uh, but I've never heard about the wind. Mm -hmm. But it's possible that there had been a time, but like you say, you know, as the gener generation went on down, well, we just lost track of it, you know, and it's the older ones before us. They didn't keep up with it, you know, and we, uh, we probably lost it along the line there because they have dances for the all other other clans of guys. Mm -hmm. Well, you're wind too, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you both wind clan, that's something. <laughs> yeah, m my mother was a wind, which we take off to her, her mother's side. My father was a bear, so I'm a son of a bear. <laughs> It almost sounds the other way, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. well he, he started talking about the uh, dances of the uh, different clans. Uh, I don't know. It's a, I'm speculating that uh, there is a wind dance, uh, which is uh, because the song uh, goes in the direction of talking about animal uh, a skunk well history traditionally uh, animal a skunk is a, is a wind clan member it, the skunk is a member of the wind clan and a rabbit is also a member of the wind clan and and, 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 a, and a rabbit is one of the uh, 
sly, foxy old animal that uh, the, the, uh, the wind people like to talk about because he's smart and he outsmarts everything. And he, he's, uh, he lives by his wits, not by the sweat of his brow. So the, the, the wind clan people, they used to brag on that rabbit stories quite a bit. Because that's the way you tell when a member is talking. They talk about a rabbit being so smart and it does everything, you know, and gets by by the uh, being smart. So you know that he, you don't have to ask him. You, you naturally know that he's a member of the wind clan. This is how we find out things. <laughs> uh, what, what are the clans for the creeks? What are the clans for the creeks? Mm -hmm. I'll let Mr. Scott answer <laughs> that one. Well, we have deer clans, bear clans, and, um, well, there's so many of them that I, you know, I, I run on to some that I, I, I would never would have thought of, and they'd, they'd say they're, uh, uh, like, uh, what is it, Chihuahua, Chihuahua has, uh, would that be deer clan? Deer, deer, deer yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Let me throw in a good one. There's a potato clan. Go ahead. Um, with the numerous ceremonies that you do, like the green corn dance, uh, you do them among the Eastern Cherokee, or I guess it's done everywhere, but not by all the people anymore. So. Do you consider that it renews the whole nation or just the people that are involved in the traditions now? That would be hard to answer. Uh, there is a tendency to, uh, to revive the, there's new generation of people coming up that's never been involved, don't know anything about ceremonies. They become beware of the value that's attached to these ceremonies. And because these Indian ceremonies, I've always liked to say, that they are the pure Americana. They're born right here. And it's so rich in heritage that they should be preserved. Well, this is a thing that this new generations are become aware of, and they want to be part of a ceremonial group. They want to learn the songs. They want to learn the dances. But they are in very precarious position because they have lost their clanship. They have lost their language. They have lost their image. They have lost their uh, total concept of being an Indian. And uh, traditionally, to be a member of a ground, some say you have to have a clan. You gotta be a member of some clan to be a full participated member, and some of these people are in a position not to ever reclaim their clan because it's been lost through years. So we don't know what's going to come about, but it's going to be very interesting. And by the same token that most of the traditional elderly people, they are reluctant to teach the, the new people that's been uh, disoriented Indian way of life. They've been away from it so long that uh, they just don't know anything about it. And perhaps, I don't know, I can't answer whether they'd be bad for the ceremonies or good for the ceremonies, but I have a tendency to believe that uh, there must be some way that this has to be worked out because a long time ago, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they didn't have this problem, but they've got it now. So we, we, I think we're going to have to work out a system some way, but uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard to decide, because you decide to uh, alienate those people, but they happen to be of Indian blood. You, you just can't, you know, ostracize them. You can't just do away with them and you have a love for them, and you care for them, you want them to be a member. So on those bases, probably that we may be able to work out a system some way that they can be a full participant. But 
right now, everything is just hanging in the air. I don't know who's going to make the, the final decisions, how are we going to, you know, allow these uh, people to come in that don't have any membership of no kind. Okay, Beverly? I don't exactly understand it, what a tribal town is. Could you more or less explain it to someone who doesn't know? <laughs> Okay, she wants to know what a tribal town is. Okay, tribal town. One is a stomp ground. Another one is ceremonial ground. And another one is, is uh, Community Center. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's, all all, it's, it's all one and the same. All it's, just, it's just a matter of calling it what, you, what it <laughs> comes naturally to you, I guess. But it's all the same. Tribal town, stomp ground, ceremonial center, they're all the same. Because most of the uh, Indians today, they don't, they, we don't call it uh, uh, stomp grounds or ceremonial center. They call it the old, the old townhouse. Because at one time, they used to have townhouses on each one of those grounds, plus the square grounds where they really actually performed the ceremonial dances. And in this house, where they talked about what I said earlier about economically, socially, history, whatever has got to be decided, they go in that house, they call it a council meeting. That's where you, all your laws are decided. But that's gone now. It's, it's, you only have this, the square grounds today, part of this uh, ceremonial center. Supposedly, I don't know if we ever have any um, enough interests, enough activities to bring some of the uh, houses back or not, but uh, I don't think there's anybody alive that really knows that what did transpire at each ceremonial ground, what was what consisted of, this, of a ceremonial center. But there are records, there are old documents that tells you what was at each ceremonial ground a long, long time ago, but it's not there anymore today. I think it's, they should at least reestablish just one for the purpose of educating people. And uh, it certainly is part of this, what we call United States, and that's where it had its beginning. I think a lot of those things should be reestablished. I'd like to make a, a point here that uh, one thing when we're talking about Creeks and Cherokees in Oklahoma now, you have to realize that they were not always there and that they were in the southeast in the southeastern states, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, North and South Carolina, Virginia. Um, that's about all. But in that area, and Louisiana too, in that area of the uh, Mississippi, <laughs> I keep forgetting. Anyway, that area of the United States and that what we're talking about in Oklahoma was indeed the reestablishment of tribal towns after the move from the east in the late 1830s when the government decided all the Indians should be shipped west of the Mississippi. And so uh, the five tribes, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole tribes were the largest and went on forced marches from the east to Indian Territory, which is now Oklahoma, and lived in five separate nations in Oklahoma, in Indian Territory, with their own constitutions, their own governments, and that sort of thing, with this loose organization of the tribal towns or districts uh, from which to draw their uh, constituents. So even though the people were transferred, they also transferred their way of life uh, to the new land and start it over again. So it's not, it, it's not unreasonable to think that it might start over again again, you know, <laughs> one more time. Okay, you had your hand up, Paul, go. By what method is the tribal council uh, ruled at this time if you don't have the uh, tribal houses any longer? It, it, it requires a, a, quite an explanation. And the way it went, of course, uh, there was always been a policy of the uh, United States government to destroy the Indian nations. And so they instilled a lot of uh, 
ill interpretations of the law and cramming some of the uh, new policies down the throat of the Indian people and they threatened to punish them and various other things so they comply with the wishes of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the government people and they went in into uh, selecting uh, tribal leaders by presidential appointment. Of course, uh, that was one of the, the uh, policies to destroy the uh, Indian nations. And this one man ruled dictatorially. One man ruled. And he didn't have to listen to no Indians or Indian people or village or anybody else. All, he'd, all the policy and anything that came out of Washington, D.C. that was conveyed to this one individual leader and and he ruled the Indian people. So council, per se, from the Indian representation did not exist, did not function. And that's the way it is today. Even though the chiefs are now elected um, and the councils are chosen, well, for the Cherokees, they just had an election to uh, choose uh, a deputy chief and council members, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they also have a community organization by which delegates from various Indian communities can send people to this larger uh, community representatives organization. They even send one from California, <laughs> which seems kind of uh, unusual, because you would think that the Indians in California would be a little out of touch. But they do send one from the California community. The whole state has one representative. Uh, I don't know if that's working any better or not. You know, it's always the man at the top who makes the policy, spends the money, and that sort of thing. So I, I don't know if this re new representative type of government for the Cherokees is helping or not. Let me comment a little bit uh, as far as the Cherokee people. Uh, it's been Norman uh, be understood historically that uh, Indian people are pretty much on their toes as far as uh, having a uh, government that's functional in, in, in the society today. Well, this wasn't so because, like uh, Charlotte said, that uh, we have elections now. Yes, we do have an elections, but perhaps it's going to take 15, 20 elections for the Indian people to get involved in it. Right now, that uh, it's going in a certain directions for over 100 years that Indians are saying, well, it's the same thing over again. Uh, why get involved? You're not going to have no uh, input in it. You're not going to make no policy. You're not going to have no say-so. So, so what? This is the feeling of the Indians today. But in due time, I think it, uh, the Indians will be involved in it. The policies will change. And the chiefs and the people in the various capacities dictating the guidelines of the Indian people, they still pretty much government-oriented people. They, they don't represent people, they, they, but hopefully this will change in due time. I think uh, we ought to maybe uh, hear some music. Do you have a song you want us to sing? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I heard you practicing. Yeah, we practiced a little <laughs> bit. <clears throat> <clears throat> we want to sing for you a uh, some ground college. The uh, Mother dance, some grounds call it the uh, friendship dance, and uh, it always, uh, you see it almost uh, any grounds that you go to, it's, it's been picked up, been danced, and uh, in, the, in the Cherokee country a long time ago, uh, they had one ceremonial day set aside where everybody came in and they're going to participate in this uh, friendship dance when they perform this dance well they sort of uh, 
gave up all their feuds, gave up all their dislikes and any hates that they entertained. And when they get through the dancing, well, they all get their full membership and friendship in the, in the community. So that's what this one song accomplished whenever they uh, went into a friendship dance. And most all the ceremonial grounds now, uh, they began their dances by members only. And whenever the uh, dances is wide open for all the participation, uh, they usually have this uh, a uh, friendship dance. <clears throat> so now, we're going to sing this one song for you. And uh, it's been a ride a long time. And uh, we think that uh, most of all the songs that we have today are very, very old. And we have a lot of strong indicators that we believe that some of the, most of all are our animal dance songs and of that nature, they go way back before Christ B.C. period, maybe 100 years, 200 years, maybe 1,000 years B.C. So we need to uh, preserve most of these dances. And uh, there is a strong possibility that we can, that we be able to preserve a lot of these old songs. I know that. Dr. Heth here is pretty much involved in trying to preserve a lot of these things, and we need more people like her to get involved. So here's Friendship Song. <clears throat> Oh, my God. 
as long. I cut the song about half. When you got the rhythm of the uh, girl shaking the leg rattles and you got a response behind you, it's a beautiful song. It's <coughs> melodious. It's, it's really pretty. And we like to preserve it. But uh, a lot of songs are in it. I think uh, Dr. Hathier knows that uh, we had to discard uh, from what I'm singing. Some of these other songs are in it that uh, has been done away with so long that some of the people don't know the response to it. And uh, if you happen to sing some of those that's unknown, then you destroy your beauty of your dance. So. We just learn to live without those old songs. That's part of the songs, but nobody knows them, so we just done away with them. We've, we've been talking about stomp dancing, and uh, you probably uh, wonder what is a stomp dance. That's a good a, 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 and uh, it's a common dance. It's uh, a lot of people know how to sing the songs. A lot of dancing. Most 99% of the dancing done by the uh, by the Southern Indians in Oklahoma, they do mostly stomp dancing all night long, all night long. And um, we'd like to sing one song for you. This is this is a typical <coughs> song that it would be a song at a ground you'd go to uh, where they're having a stomp dancing. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, yeah. 
Vocation. Has music always been your vocation? She wanted to know what your jobs have been throughout your life. First, uh, the thing that happened to me is, is I got into military service and I put 21 years in military service, Air Force. I flew around different parts of the world. Then after I retired from the service, I went to work for the United States Post Office, and I put in about 12, 13 years, and I retired from that, too. And so now I, uh, I have little time that I do what I'm doing now. I travel different parts of the country, and I lecture, and teach the kids how to sing and research on music, history, and uh, all of these things. I hope that I'll be able to put it in written form, can be preserved from here on. I happen to be born in a traditional home. My grandfather played a very important part in the Cherokee country. They were very uh, ceremonial people from all the way back that were responsible for carrying a sacred fire over the Trail of Tears to what is now Oklahoma, which I've already talked some about. And uh, a lot of people questioned my knowledge. I said, well, well you're too young. You, what do you, how come you know so much? Well, I had to listen to it, you know. It, it was told in my home, and that was part of our practically our daily functions in my household. And I just, if I didn't listen, if I didn't hear it today, I'm, I won't hear the same thing tomorrow. This is the way they, uh, in my home, they handed down a lot of traditions, a lot of songs, a lot of history, a lot of customs. So uh, I, I just happened to be born in a proper home where all these things was available. That's how I come. I've retained a lot of it, and I've, and I've read a lot of history. I've read a lot of books. And those two together, uh, I've been asked to, you know, give lectures at various places, and I enjoy doing it. Huh? I said, even at UCLA. <laughs> what do you mean by carrying the sacred fire over the, the Trail of Tears? Well, a uh, long, long time ago, uh, somebody came from the heaven to the earth, to the Indian people. At that time, they delivered the sacred fire. And that time, the, the fire was spread to all the Indian people. And it's been told time and time again. You hear that from different tribes all over the United States. However, they do practice it. They do handle their forest differently. Matter of fact, uh, they only, some tribes only care an imitation of an original sacred fire. So that's the origin of the sacred fire. What was that? Well, see, uh, of course, most all the southern Indians, which I know more about, each one had its own ceremonial ground, which maintained a sacred fire. Up to about 17, latter part of, early part of 1700, probably, latter part of 1600, supposedly most all the southern Indians entertained, uh, uh, carried uh, eternal flame, actually burning actual coal, actual fire. They, they had people assigned there just do nothing but take care of the fire. Of course, uh, due, to, uh, due to progress, due to rising civilizations, you're getting smart and you're going to do things and you want to be individualistic. And all, these, all adds up to the point where there were less and less ceremonial functions and, and change of life and various other things, the fire went out. 
far went out and it went into this sacred ashes concept. The Indians saw this thing as, as coming to the point where uh, something's going to happen, people are losing interest, and, and, and they went into the, uh, oh, they have, each tribe practically has its own way of uh, say, seeking help from the world beyond. And they went into that, and then they got the message that it's the only thing they can do. Next best thing you can do is to go into the sacred ashes concept. In other words, the fire that came from the heaven to the earth, it, it, it was kept burning for long periods of time. Then it went into the sacred ashes concept, where you let the fire go out, but you still maintain the ashes. That's the status quo for all ceremonial grounds in eastern Oklahoma today. They don't burn there 24 hours a day. But we know where the ceremonial ground is. We know where the fireplace is. We know where the sacred ashes are at. We just relight it. That's the price that we paid for our progress, of getting, you know, what we are today. Television, telephone, Automobiles, airplane. You got to give something for something that you. So we still maintain this sacred place. Southern Indians, they don't dance just anywhere. They don't say, okay, we're going to dance over the Fifth and Walker. <laughs> we're going to dance over in the eastern part of the Panhandle. We've got to go back to that sacred square, sacred ground, where our sacred fire is. And the holy man, the medicine man, or whoever is designated to take care of the fire, he goes there at a certain time and relights the fire ceremoniously, whatever the method they, they use. They relight that fire. And they use it for the ceremonial purpose. You mean you're putting, but you're always putting new wood on the what? ashes. Are you always putting new wood on the ashes? Oh yeah, so uh, you, you use different uh, wood all the time, and the dead wood is to keep the fire burning for that period of ceremonial. For that one day or two days or whatever day that you're gonna, you know, be. Uh, having a ceremonial function, you'll have it burning for that period. Then you save the ashes? You save the ashes? Yeah. Well, the ashes are there. Nobody moves them. But for all the sacred fires that you had, you kept the ashes right there? In the, 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 the actual heart of the fire is buried into the ground. Mm -hmm. During your ceremonials, you have uh, a song leader yourself. Do you, can you last all night singing, or do you have many song leaders who carry on? Well, each grounds, they have uh, some persons like me is knowledgeable in various animal songs. If they're elected to do the dance, well, I'll ask the singer to sing some of these songs like quail dance, horse dance, bear dance, and various other things. But uh, like we did a while ago, stomp dancing. Well, uh, the various people that come to the grounds, they know each other by appearance and by knowing that they are capable singers. The ceremonial priest will go around and select each one to lead a song, just like he led a while ago. Then the same priest would go around and select somebody else, and he'll announce it, and they'll do that. Then they do another one, they do another one all around the clock, till 6 o'clock in the morning or daybreak, daylight time. It's a must. Um, when the dance has, uh, the ceremonial has gone on all night, um, do the people expect to put in a full day's work the next day too, or is it the next day accepted to be rest? Or right. You do wish. They're expected to, uh, to do what they do normally. And they enjoy it. They like it. The day before that, the night they're going to have a dance, 
Uh, now, this is something we used to go through, which we don't do today. Uh, we're getting weak. We didn't eat anything all day. No, not a bite. Till when the sun goes down, why, uh, we get to drink water. Not water, but the medicine that the medicine had made, medicine man had made. We get to drink that. Then we stomp all night. But that's going away now. See, they take medicine, but they get out, they, they get out about one, two o'clock in the evening. Now, that's, that's the medicine they take today. We used to just go there all day and all night without eat anything to eat and stomp dance all night long. How long and that was uh, the same as here, you know. You asked a while ago about was they able to go to work the next day. Well, I could remember the days back yonder where, when we didn't have to work. See, that was back time when the Indians had land. And uh, we had a lot of games, you know. And I could remember when uh, we didn't have it just now, we have it on Friday, uh, starting Friday nights and Saturday, and, and uh, Sunday is the day that they play ball and maybe sleep a little bit. But back in those days, we had it just any night. Could be Monday night or Wednesday night or any time. But when my dad <clears throat> and my mother, they go camp, they go in a wagon, and uh, we'd stay there, oh, three, maybe three, four days. You know, and go back. Of course, that time we, uh, I don't think Dad had to go to work no more. He, he wasn't working. <laughs> there wasn't no jobs. We know we. Uh, Suppose it was the time that you should be gathering whatever foods or harvesting your, your crops or, or mm -hmm. out uh, hunting the game. Mm -hmm. uh, you would go on with with the normal activity. Well, as time goes by, it's getting rougher, rougher by the day now. Uh, our, our generation today, we think we can't get by without working less than one hour today. Back in those days, it didn't, it didn't bother them. And uh, they didn't have to work. And all they did was uh, maybe if they was uh, make a little peel for corn, uh, make, to make bread, softy, nabusky, and all of that, you know. And that wouldn't be very much of that. And that corn today, I noticed some hanging up in your house the other day. Now that's the kind of corn they planted, and they, and it didn't fail. And back in those days, they had the rain when they wanted, you know. And then they, and the ground, the old Mother Earth, was in good shape then. It had strength. And today you have to fertilize it and, and water it and this and that, and still it may not make nothing. And uh, cause we just get so weak. And uh, us Indians, we're the same way. We're getting weak just as the world goes weaker. And, we can't do what we used to. That's, we pro that's progress. Yeah. We have just time for about one more question. Um, what besides the beginning of these stomp dances, like you say, they could be at any times, so like once a month or once a week or more or less, but what decides when you're going to have one so everyone knows? I guess the elders do well, that, don't they? Uh -huh. uh, like, now, next month, uh, my ground will be started next month, about 15th or 20th of next month. And the others, they'll start up about long in there, too. But we have what we call a squirrel soup dinner. And uh, one of them, uh, we have one long, uh, maybe in January or February, and catch some, you know, on a nice day, and they, they have a, a squirrel soup dinner. And, uh, and maybe another month or so, like uh, yesterday, uh, at my ground, they had uh, squirreled in yesterday. Now, that's the second time. That's the last one for this spring, you know. And uh, so next month, they'll be, the elders will be thinking about what day we should select for uh, the beginning of the storm, the storm dance. And that goes on four, four dances in the fall, along in November, September, uh, October and November, right in those three months, why they want to clear up those other two uh, dinners. See, they have four soup dinners, too, you know, along with the storm dances. Yeah, I think we're going to have to quit now, so uh, I'd like to thank our two guests for coming and sharing their songs and their knowledge and friendship with all of us. <laughs>